I'd like to welcome you to this edition of EMU Today TV. My name is Mark S. Lee, and I'm your host, and we're so glad that you're joining us for another exciting show where we are going to be featuring a couple of exciting programs this, this particular month. So I'm so pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Karen Ann Craig, and she's the Associate Professor of Finance, Department of Accounting and Finance for the College of Business. Karen Ann Craig, thank you very much for joining me. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me today. It's so good to have you as well. And I got to tell you, so it's my understanding, we have a brand new program, relatively new program, uh, that's at the College of Business, it's a master's program. I'm going to have you talk briefly about it, well, exactly what is it and how long has it been around at COB? Well, it's the Master's of Science of Finance. I call it the MSF program because, you know, that's too hard for me to say that many words. Um, it's been around, our, our, inaugural, our inaugural class started in 2019 in the fall. And um, it's really designed to give the students a really good in-depth knowledge base of finance. Um, it's a lot different than, say, an MBA program, where when you're in an MBA program, there's probably more breadth. This is, you know, just really delves deep into finance. And we are affiliated with the Charter Financial Institute, uh, Charter Financial Analyst Institute, which is uh, a designation, the CFA exam that, and the CFA um, charter holder um, designation is very prestigious in finance. And so our program is affiliated with the CFA Institute as well, which means we align 70% or more of our program aligns with the CFA body of knowledge. And that really gives that students the ability, they can take our program, finish with a master's degree, which will help them in the industry, or they can, it kind of prepares them to take the chartered financial analyst exams, which is just, like I said, it's the gold standard of certifications that you can get as a finance professional. And it's my understanding that this program, Karen, is relatively new. As I believe it's been around since 2019. Correct. And you are one of the major uh, creators and, and innovators and drivers of this program. Now, uh, why did Eastern Michigan University decide to offer a master's in this particular space? What we're finding is that employers want that specialization. They really demand that kind of in-depth knowledge. And that's something that the master's gives you. Again, I had mentioned before, where something like an MBA is broader, the MSF provides that in-depth. And finance is such a um, diverse, yeah, intensive program. And everybody thinks finance, they think of the stock market because that's mm -hmm. what the news reports. But there's so much more to finance than just the stock market. And to have that ability to really deep thinking and in-depth knowledge base of the program. That's what we're hoping to pass on to our students, really help them in the markets, because we do see that the employers are demanding that, that level of expertise. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an intense 30 credit hour curriculum uh, that allows students to complete the program very quickly. Now, put that in perspective for me, 30 hours, is that standard? Is that accelerated? What is the standard class, if you will, in terms of getting a master's program or a bachelor's degree? So if you were to compare it, for example, to EMU's MBA program, assuming that the um, foundation course were completed, the MBA program is 36 credit hours. However, in total, 30 credit hours for a MSF program is the, is the standard. Um, however, our program is set up uniquely that we have this advantage that our students um, can continue to work and complete their master's of science of finance program. We find, especially geographically and what our student profile is, this is, this is in high demand. Um, so it, it enables the students to complete it within a uh, five semesters. So it's a fall, winter, summer, fall, winter time period. And one other thing that we find that's advantageous is for international students as well. A lot of inter international students prefer our program because it is STEM designated, mm -hmm. um, which gives them the opportunity to um, have that optimal, optimal practical training where they stay in the U.S. for a longer period of time after graduation. And by having a program that runs those five semesters, it gives international students more time to find placement for their OPT, uh, which is beneficial for them as well. And what exactly is OPT? Okay, so the STEM designation is a designation that is, is instilled or put forth by the U.S. Um, uh, Department of Homeland Security. And it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And we get that designation because of the mathematics. Our finance program is intensive in the mathematics compo component of it. 
So traditionally then students that come in for education come in with like an F F1 visa. And the standard would be that with an F1 visa, you can stay in the United States and work under what they call again, optional practical training or OPT for 12 months. But because our program is STEM designated, students can apply to stay in the United States and work longer, up to 24 months longer. And so that would extend out the total OPT time to 36 months. And uh, you know, OPT is one of the best ways for international students to earn a work visa or even possibly their US citizenship during that time period. Um, and that is, you know, the United States as a whole attracts and retains a lot of their STEM related professionals in, in all industries through this OPT um, option. So let me, let's, I'm going to better understand. <clears throat> let's, let's unpack the STEM designated component because a lot of times we think of STEM, we think about, uh, you know, in the technology space, for example, right. I know science, technology, what am I missing? Science, science technology, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you very much. So, so that STEM designated, designated what does that mean in, in the Master's of Science and Finance, that, that STEM designated program? Exactly what is that and what are the benefits to that for students going through it? Well, again, we because of the math that's the basis of the program. Oh, it's the math. Got it. it. Yes. So the finance program gets that designation because it's very extensive in math from regression analysis um, the, to the derivatives calculations, Black-Scholes models uh, for evaluating options. It, it, again, very math intensive. Uh, Got, it. Got it. So, so let's talk about uh, students wanting to get into this program. What are some of the prereqs? It sounds like, you know, like you said, very mathematically intensive, if you will. Uh, talk about the prereqs and what does it require for students to get engaged or involved in this program? So one of the nice things with the prereqs is we don't have, we don't require you to have to have a business degree. If you don't have a degree in business, um, you may have to take an accounting class and an econ class prior to the program or concurrent with the other classes. But, you know, I actually came out of an engineering field, my undergraduate degrees in engineering, and I made the switch to business. And there are a lot of people who work in engineering, mathematics, actuarial science. They are in that because they love math. And that's what I love about finance is the math portion. So we don't have any of those prereqs that somebody who is working as an engineer or somebody who's working in actuarial or other fields, accounting, that they decide they want to come into finance. Um, it is very open. Our prereqs include... Uh, just basically uh, qualifications, right? Have you passed your GMAT and do you have a high enough um, GPA? And we really look at that as success for students. Now, this fall, we are waiving the GMAT or GRE. We, require, we take either requirements because of COVID. So we're trying to open it up and we understand the hardships that can be with students having to take either GMAT or GRE. And for students who may be you know, they, they got through their undergraduate program and maybe their GPA really wasn't what they thought it would be, but they, mm -hmm. math is their strength. We also do allow conditional acceptance where students who maybe didn't meet the GPA that we, we require, but took the GMAT and they did really well on the GMAT, we'll use that as an indicator of performance and we can conditionally admit students into the program as well. So I don't want somebody to think, well, you know, I, I didn't quite get serious about my undergraduate program to right before I graduated, but I've been working in the industry for five or 10 years. And I really want that master's degree. I think it'll help, you know, accelerate my career that we, we would not uh, push anyone away for that. We really want to help the students. And again, that's why we have that conditional acceptance for students that maybe um, have realized that they, you know, they got that seriousness that maybe put their GPA a little bit lower in the past. So, so a student gets a master of science and finance, for example, this degree, what, what types of jobs are out there for those who are graduating with this particular degree? What, what can they basically, uh, what can they land, the types of opportunities out there for them? I mean, one nice thing about the finance industry is there's a huge demand of jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics puts the outlook for a financial analyst, financial managers up considerably faster than anything on the average. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really helping them. Also, finance is a regulated industry. So regulation also ensures there's always going to be jobs, but they can have jobs such as portfolio managers, research and investment analysts, financial advisors, wealth managers, um, risk analysts. They can be corporate financial analysts and just anything in investment banking as well. So there's a variety of jobs available 
and demand, definitely demand. And, and let's just tell you straight up benefits, I would say for this degree are high pay and high demand. And the high pay is really uh, a lot, what a lot of people, what drives a lot of people to the major as well. Well, you know, we're living in these unusual times with, with the COVID-19, the pandemic, and hopefully we'll get out of this somewhere down the road. The vaccines are being rolled out. We know that. Um, so I hear you saying that these, these jobs are in demand, but we know that businesses are certainly looking for how to control their expenses, their financials, identifying sources of revenue, all things that businesses are grappling with today. This seems like it's a great opportunity for students to go in there into those organizations and make a difference. Well, and you said it, you know, businesses are looking how to control their financials. Well, you know, the people that help them figure out how to do that, it's the finance graduates. And um, how many students were in the inaugural year for, for this particular program, the Master of Science in, uh, in Finance? And how many are you expecting, how many are you hoping for this upcoming fall later this year? Well, so when we launched our program, we didn't see a lot of, we, I wasn't able to do this. We didn't see a lot of advertising. So it was a very small program. Um, we're set up and designed to have a 25 student cohort if we can get demand. And I do think one of the things that put us at a disadvantage when we first started was we didn't have that STEM designation yet. Mm -hmm. um, and that really drives demand. And now that we have that STEM designation, we're hoping for, we're hoping for 25 students, but it is a new program. And we've seen in the past, uh, starting new masters in accounting programs, it takes a few years to build it up and get get everything um, in place where we're, we're advertising and we're hitting the right markets to get that demand. And, and where are you recruiting from, Karen? What, what high school? I mean, I'm sorry, what colleges or what programs are you recruiting to get students into the program as well? Well, so I'm not directly responsible for that, but I have participated. Um, our graduate program does... Uh, information sessions that they do online that I've spoken to. We uh, attended the Financial Management Association Student Leader Conference last year, which was which is designed for undergraduate students. So we did attend that. Unfortunately, COVID, it was right when COVID started in New York City. So I don't think we got the impact that we would have liked to have seen from that because of unfortunately COVID. Um, but we've we've advertised in, in the local Detroit business uh, publications as well. And internationally, I do think, again, we, we are seeing a lot of uh, interest from international students. Well, uh, as we wrap up, is there a website or contact information where people watching this particular show, this, this video uh, about this program, where can I get more information? Well, if you go to our, if you just do the www.emish.edu front slash finance, which is our shortcut, you can cl click on our graduate programs link on that main page. It's the easiest way to get there. And anyone can look me up on our web pages and reach out to me directly. They can reach out to our graduate programs directly as well. And you can you see at the bottom of the screen, we have the website listed for you. So make sure you make a note, go check it out. Karen and Craig, Dr. Craig, I want to thank you very much and congratulate you for getting this program off the ground. We wish you much continued success with it. I appreciate it. I, I love this program. Our students we've had through it are incredible, and I've just been very pleased and thrilled to even be able to teach them in this program. All right. We want you all to sit back and watch this video called Points of Pride about Eastern Michigan University.
welcome back to EMU Today TV. I hope you enjoyed that video. The points of pride, all the great things we're having at Eastern Michigan University. And I'm so pleased to welcome this particular segment, Mr. Gregory Peoples. He's the John W. Porter Distinguished Award winner. Uh, recently announced the 2020 awardees that we have featured one last uh, episode and we're featuring Mr. Peoples today. Uh, he's the Emeritus Dean of Students and the University Ombudsman for Eastern and Michigan University. Greg Peoples, thanks for joining me. How you doing? Thanks, Mark. How are you? It's so good, good to, to see, see you. you. I haven't seen you in a while. No, no, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. And and let's just kind of unpack. First of all, congratulations for, for being a name, the John W. Porter Distinguished Service Awardee. And let's talk about your distinguished background at Eastern Michigan. Uh, you were the former role, I'm sorry, you were the former dean of students for the university. Uh, talk to us about that. Talk about your role and, and, and what you did there as a dean of students. Well, uh, first, I, I want to start by saying I, I started off as the associate dean of students back in 1991. Uh, I was the associate dean of students for uh, Dean Betty White then. And uh, I, I uh, was very, very proud to work at Eastern. Um, I had worked at Eastern from 77 to, to 83, and then I left. And I came back to uh, Eastern in 1991 because it was such a great place to work. Um, my experience as dean of students was wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't have enjoyed it more. Yeah. You know, and we were just talking. When I was president of student body, 81, 1981 to 82, and I remember uh, I would run into you on campus uh, in, in my position as a uh, East Michigan University student body president and, and your position in the administration. You talk about a small world going, going full circle, huh? Right, exactly. When I was there, when, when, when you were the, uh, uh, the president of student body, I was working in the admissions office there. Yeah. And, uh, and if you remember correctly, uh, Vice President Smith then had started an um, uh, on-campus programming center called the Interact Center. And that's where they had all the students come to visit the campus. It start, they start at the Interact Center and go through uh, the campus from there. So that was, a, that was a great experience. It was a great experience because that, that office at the time was very new, Mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an opportunity to develop into a, a, a basically what we have, what you have on campus now is the, uh, uh, I think it's called the Admissions Center. It's, uh, it's in the Student Center building. But that really started off as the Campus Interact Center in Starkweather Hall. And, and, and you're also university ombudsman. For those who may be tuning in, exactly what is the ombudsman? The ombudsman. So um, the ombudsman role was created in uh, 2004 when the university was first experiencing some financial difficulties. And um, we had the dean of students office and we had the office of campus life. And Unfortunately, the resources for the, um, the dean of students office and the uh, campus life office were, were stretched very thin. And so we really decided at that point in time, Mark, to create an office um, for students who had issues with the campus, uh, but they weren't necessarily dean of students related. They were uh, related to maybe a billing issue or maybe a housing issue, or maybe a, maybe a parent had a concern about something they had transacted with one of their students. And so that's why we developed the Ombudsman Center. So it, it really helped the students to navigate certain challenges that they might have. On exactly, campus. exactly. Gotcha. In fact, I, I used to say to students, the, the purpose of the Ombudsman's Office is really to help you and your family navigate through the university system. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and speaking of, of, you've been involved with the university for a long time. Uh, and I, I, you know, again, you're the John W. Porter Distinguished Service Awardee. And when I was a student there, when you were there, Dr. Porter was the president, uh, was the president of the university. That's, exactly. That's amazing. So let's talk about all the years. There's been a lot of changes over the years at EMU. From your perspective, uh, what are some of the changes that you have seen since, you know, your long tenure for, for the university, your long tenure of service, outstanding service? What are some of the changes that you have seen at EMU? Um, well, you know, Mark, I, I, um, I consider myself to be a student affairs professional, and I think during the time I was there, actually the 20-some years I was there, the student affairs position, the student affairs offices took a prominent role on the campus. Um, we were very much involved with the faculty. We were very much involved with students, and actually, I tell people all the time, I love being the dean of students, and I love being the ambassador, but I really love being the, the dean of students because 
it gave me an opportunity to grow with some of the students that were attending at that point in time. I tell people all the time, I, I, we learned as much from the students as I think the students learned from us. And if you, if you think about it, Mark, um, there are so many uh, students who uh, I've interacted with who have gone into university administration, um, not necessarily because of me, but I think because of the work we did with the students while we were on campus. Sure. Well, you know, it's nice that you, you've maintained, I'm sure you've maintained relationships with those students. And it's got to be one of the greatest joys of your career is not only did you work for the university, but over the years to watch your students succeed and get to the next level personally as well as professionally. I'm sure that's got to make you feel good. Oh, that makes me feel just wonderful, Mark. You know, I, um, <laughs> It's, 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 it's hard to be humble, but, you know, uh, so many of those students, well, I'll give you a couple of examples. This is how uh, I feel that we were, and it's not only me, it's our entire student affairs division that took, that was there when I was there. But um, there's so many things, and you, you mentioned keeping in touch with students. I saw your interview with um, <clears throat> President Martin and I noticed, you know, you asked me about the naming of the Judy Sturgis Hill building. And um, Judy was, she was an icon on campus as well. But, you know, I, you know it, it, this is how, um, this is how, you know, you think you did a pretty good job. So when Judy passed, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a shock for all of us. But um, I remember getting a call from um, a young lady. Her name now is uh, Dr. Shatina Jones. And Satina is the dean of students at Wilberforce University in Ohio. Mm -hmm. But Satina called me and she said, Dean Peoples, I'm just calling to see if you're okay. And I said, what do you mean, Satina? She said, well, because, you know, we lost Judy. And I said, oh, and it just touched my heart so much because, again, she remembered the relationship that we had. And so it was more or less like a family because, and so she called to make sure I was okay, you know, and uh, that, was, that was really pretty nice. In another instance, and I, and I have to mention this, is um, <clears throat> a student by the name of Tyrell, Tyran Burrell. Um, he was, um, he, he had been at Eastern, for, I don't exactly remember the, remember the years he was there. But um, Tyran and his mother came in at, to visit me as a freshman. I was the ombudsman then. But he came in to visit me, she came to visit me as a freshman because he had um, had some problems in the residence hall. And um, I didn't remember that. I only rem remembered him coming in during his senior year. And then after his senior year, you know, he came in, well, actually he had been dismissed from school, but he came back into school. But during his senior year, um, he came to visit me again because uh, he was running out of financial aid. And this, and so I said, well, you know, um, and I, at that point in time, I had a little bit of scholarship money I could offer the students. And I did, but subsequent to that, uh, Mark, um, I don't know if you remember Reggie Burns, but Reggie called me after I had retired like about two or three years ago. And he said, Greg, he said, I hope you don't mind this. He said, but the students want to name a scholarship after you. Oh. And I said, really? He said, yes. He said, Tyran Burrell took the lead. And he said that they wanted to name a scholarship after you. And they wanted to name the scholarship, the Greg Peoples Degree Completion Scholarship, because a lot of times students come to me at the end of their junior, senior year, for particularly their senior year, and they would they just need a couple hundred dollars to get it through so they could finish their 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 academic promise. And so that was the purpose of the scholarship. And it was because of Tyran who um, established that scholarship. Well, but it talks to the also Greg Peoples, it talks about your personal involvement with the university and the community. Talk about the importance. Why did you say, you know, why did you stay so engaged and so involved with the students? and also the community at large. Why, why was that important to you? Well, because, um, Mark, <laughs> I don't know how much time you have, but so when I was growing up, I had, um, I was the fourth of five kids and I had an older brother who was uh, 10 years older than me. And uh, I grew up in Kent, Ohio. <clears throat> and Kent, Ohio was very much like um, uh, uh, Eastern Michigan University. Uh, they're, they're both Mac schools. They're about the same size, whatever. But when my older brother was going to Kent State, Mark, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the students of color, particularly the black students, 
would come to town and they would stay in the black community. They, they couldn't stay up on campus um, mm-hmm. in the residence hall. They didn't have, and they, they certainly didn't have a, dean of stu- or a, a student affairs program. So what happened, Mark, is my family, like other black families in the community of Kent, took students in and they became the counselors, the advisors, the, uh, the, the food service people because they live with us. And so when, so I got my interest in education and my community involvement uh, naturally because my parents did the same thing for black students at, at that point in time. But I also think, uh, Mark, it's very important for the university to have a relationship with the members of the community. Um, uh, Ypsilanti has, uh, they, over the years, over the years, they've had a pretty good relationship with the, uh, the black community uh, in, in the city, but it was, it's just very important and the other reason I became involved in the community, Mark, is because um, I have four children. And um, I don't know if you remember Juanita Reed. Uh, Juanita Reed was a member of the, the Rilo Run School Board. And she had decided she was going to retire. And we both lived in that community at that time. And she asked me if I would be interested in uh, becoming involved in the school board. So that's what I, that was my first involvement in the school board. And the reason I became involved and the school board markers because I believe if you're going to be, uh, 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 if you're going to have issues with the school that your children are attending, you need to be a part of making the, rest of the uh, solution to the problem. And so that's yes. why I became involved. At first at Rilla Run, and then I went to Lincoln, and I was on their board for uh, eight years. And, that, and then I was on the, at the same time, I was on the Washington Intermediate School Board. But that also shows how, as we begin to wrap up here, uh, the, 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 how Eastern Michigan University is intertwined with the community. I mean, you know, I, I'm an instructor there, and, and a lot of people are engaged in the university, but it's so great to see the university community involved briefly with the city of Ypsilanti and helping young people. Mm-hmm. Um, I also belong to a group called the 20 Club, which is really a town and gown um, organization. It's made up of 20 uh, university people and 20 um, members of the city of Ypsilanti community, particularly businessmen. Yeah. And they meet once a month and they, they have various speakers that help uh, draw attention to the university and also to the uh, community. So that also continues to link there as well. Well, you know, you know Greg, he was, I've known you for a long time. I want to congratulate you again for being the John W. Porter Distinguished Service Award. And we appreciate all the service that you've given to our great institution. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's Thank you, Mark. It's been a, it's been a one. It's been an honor. Thank you. Absolutely. It's an honor. And you know what? In the last couple of months, we have featured 2020 winners of the Alumni Awards. And now you see why. You see Mr. Peoples. You see Greg Peoples' enthusiasm, his passion. And we're so proud of all the awardees. And we know we're, doing a, we're here during a pandemic. But we want to make sure that we acknowledge them. If you see them, acknowledge them. Feel free to reach out to them. And I, I want to congratulate all of them. All right. Thank you for joining us for this particular month of EMU Today TV. And we will check you out next time. <laughs>